thank you very much indeed for for having Erin and I to to join you today. We uh, we're delighted to uh, to be chatting to you, and uh, we certainly hope that you get uh, a little bit of value from what we we're going to chat about uh, um, today. What we we're going to talk about is something that I um, have have had. Um, uh, some amazing experiences with over my my career in working with the mining industry, and that's just uh, developing a simple and effective standard operating procedure. It's something that people very very frequently get very very wrong, and it's such an important part of any safety system. And it doesn't matter how sophisticated the company is, it's a really really important part of it. So we'll we'll talk about that today, just very quickly. I just want to give you a little bit of background about who we are. Now, business has really developed three arms to it, I suppose. And the, the one is training. We do a lot of training programs for exploration geologists and mining companies. We do consulting um, in terms of tender design and tender specifications. And we have a very, very strong auditing arm. We do a lot of safety auditing for mining companies. And then the one most recent development uh, we started about three years ago is a very, very uh, a wonderful website we started called DrillSafe. And it's a website dedicated entirely to improving safe, safety performance on drill sites. But uh, it would be very interesting if any of you visited the website. It's very simple. It's www.drillsafe.co.za. And I'd be very interested to hear if you guys got any comments on it. There's some very useful stuff in there. Again, just very quick. Quickly, just to, to set a, a little bit of our philosophy in, in place, we have for the last nine or 10 years been working very closely with drill site safety on, on exploration sites, mineral sites. And our philosophy is that there, there are four cornerstones, there are four aspects, four um, legs, if you like, to managing safety on a drill site. Now, it doesn't matter if it's an exploration site, a mineral exploration or an oil and gas site. Uh, it's the same principles that apply. We we have the equipment that is used, and we all understand that equipment fairly well. And that equipment is used in a particular environment. Um, the local environment will modify greatly how that equipment is used. We then have the people who actually use that equipment and 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 acquit or conduct the processes. And they are, without a doubt, the biggest potential hazard in, in any operation. And then what I feel is the most, the, the, the least respected, if you like, of these four cornerstones are the processes, the activities, the procedures. And if we don't have the procedures right, it's the procedures or the processes that govern how those other three elements interact. And if the processes aren't right, we're asking for an accident to happen. So what we've got to do is balance those four, make sure that those four, that where they interact, their interaction is, is correct. And that really is the fundamentals of our philosophy in terms of how we manage safety on drill sites. So I'm going to run through this. A lot of these principles are very, very simple, and many of you guys will understand these principles very clearly. First of all, what is an SOP? It's a, it's a document that describes the safest and the most efficient way in which to carry out a complex procedure. And there's some words there that are important. An SOP must be written. It can't be a, a, a verbal set of instructions or a, a verbal set of, um, of steps. It must be a written document. Secondly, we only develop SOPs for complicated procedures, for multi-step procedures. Um, and and not for simple, and not for not for simple two or, or three step procedures. The most important part, the main purpose of the SOP, is to ensure that we identify the safest way of conducting that procedure. And then the most important word, probably, is that it is a standard. There's no ifs or ands or buts in an SOP. There's one way that we've decided to conduct this operation, this procedure. And we have decided that this is the best way. It therefore becomes a standard. Why do we need SOPs? Most certainly in South Africa, we have many legal requirements. We have very, very stringent legal requirements that require us to, to, to develop SOPs for complex work. 
And then, of course, it's best practice. It's our common law duty to make sure that our people are safe and that they work in the best possible way. And so we have two two main requirements. Very often, best practice or your common law duty to predict to to protect your employees is more important than the than the legal requirement. Uh, in South Africa, all exploration drilling activities are governed by the Mine Health and Safety Act. And there are 113 separate references in the Mine Health and Safety Act to the requirement to develop procedures. A similar situations occur in Namibia and Botswana, our neighboring countries. In Namibia, the regulations relating to the health and safety of employees at work makes 54 references to the requirement for procedures. And it's made nine, uh, 16 times in the mines, quarries, works and machinery regulations of Botswana. In every case, the word procedure is a requirement to define how work is done uh, through a set of well-formulated steps. We all know that an SOP is developed as a result or the requirement for an SOP comes from a risk assessment. And we're all, I'm sure, very familiar with a, with a risk assessment process. And an SOP really then is an administrative control. It's one of our control methods to control a set of hazards that we have identified through our risk assessment process. So, so more correctly then, we could say that an SOP is an administrative tool that is designed to minimize or control risk. So we could go back to our definition. We can kind of reword that earlier definition. We can say that an SOP is an administrative control. It's not just a document. It's an administrative control. It's part of our hierarchy of controls. It's part of the outcome of our risk assessment. Um, and that, I think, is very, very important to bear in mind. And I'll, I'll, I'll reemphasize that as we go down a little bit later. One point I want to make here, we develop SOPs for procedures and not for equipment. I frequency, frequently see people writing an SOP for a drill rig. We don't write SOPs for drill rigs. We write SOPs for procedures that tell us how we use that drill rig in, in different ways for different operations. So just, again, something important to, to, to bear in mind. Very often, contractors, operators say that they don't need SOPs. They say it's just more work, you're making our lives difficult, and our guys know what to do. In my experience, yes, very often you find crews um, who are very experienced at what they're doing, but that does not necessarily mean that they're doing it in the best way. It might not be the safest, and it most certainly may not be the most um, efficient. And so in developing an SOP, we have to really, really drill down into the detail of the procedure and the detail of the activity that we're doing to, to ensure we get the best outcome, the best uh, set of steps, um, and so on, as we'll, we'll see in a, in a few minutes. If you develop an SOP correctly with the correct team of people and you follow the correct procedures in, 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 in developing an SOP, you will, I guarantee you, you will identify more hazardous conditions than you did in the risk assessment. It's a really important part of the whole safety management process. And I'll, I'll show you just now what I mean by that. So what does a good SOP look like? Well, an SOP, because we all work for, for big corporate uh, organizations, we've got to have the front end. And the front end of an SOP, is it's important. Um, and it details the purpose of the SOP, the description of what it's about, the scope of the SOP, it references applicable legislation, what PPE you require, et cetera, et cetera. The, the main part of the SOP is the body, the, the sequence of steps and the safe work procedure we, we follow. And the front end and the body must, must marry together, obviously. They must talk to one another. But the body of the SOP is the part that is, generally speaking, uh, um, not as well done as it as it should be or as it or as it could be. So on the front end, it must have a clear statement of the scope of the SOP, and this is where I frequently find people make mistakes: is they haven't really thought about what this SOP is for. They haven't thought of all the detail, and so it doesn't clearly define what you are trying to do in this SOP. If you do that 
you will then clearly, it will tell you straight away what the name or the title of that SOP must be. And that is the very first line that anybody would read when they read the SOP. If that is not clear, well, then the rest is not going to be clear. So that is critically important. It must obviously have an identification number with dates uh, and so on. We must reference any applicable legislation or documentation or policy that is internal to your business that, that regulates or affects that procedure. We must clearly have a, 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 an outline of what any definitions or abbreviations are. We tend to use lots of abbreviations. Um, People don't know what those abbreviations mean. They mean something to you, but not necessarily to the person that's that's using that SOP. We must avoid abbreviations as much as possible. And we must very clearly state up front what special tools or PPE are required. And it's important, guys, if you look at this now, this is all done in the front end. This is the start of the document. Very frequently what we find in an SOP is the guys at step 13 will tell you that you need a special tool. Well, you should have told me that in the beginning because then I could have made sure the tool was there. You can't stop halfway through the procedure to go and find the special tool that you require or the special piece of PPE. The body is the most difficult part. This is the, and, and we'll, I'll show you just now, a very simple, you might laugh at the example, but a very simple example of how we develop an SOP. And it's in three parts. The body of an SOP is three columns. The, the first column, is the sequence of steps that you take to complete the procedure. The second column is a column where we list the hazards associated with each step. And in the third column, we, um, we detail the safe work procedure, the way that we will carry out that step so that nobody is harmed and there is no loss. Um, so it's three very simple steps, simple uh, uh, three columns uh, um, that we that we will populate. So just an example of of how some of the work I've done for mining companies before. Um, this would be an example of a front page. Uh, you could have it. There's a million ways you can do this. Um, uh, this is just one example, but it's a, it should be a standard format that you use for all of your SOPs, so that people who read it and use the SOP can understand what you're saying in them. There's always a table of contents. An SOP should not be lengthy. Um, and we'll talk about different types of SOP just now, but but an SOP must not be 30 or 40 pages. It can't be. It's it's it must if it's that long, I think then what you're trying to do is is cover too many too many uh, uh, steps, too many procedures. Maybe there's more than one procedure in what you're doing. So this is an example of, of what I would, would put in. Um, they're not lengthy, they're not long, they're not wordy, just short, sharp definitions, statements of what the purpose, the scope is, who's responsible for this procedure, what the levels of responsibility are. Um, we reference any supporting material. In this case, um, uh, there were manuals for this, this draw rig. Uh, the Mine Health and Safety Act, the Minerals Act in South Africa, and so on. So you can put this as all standard, um, but very clearly the purpose of the scope must be well defined for your particular SOP. In this particular case, um, this particular SOP that I've just extracted these pages from was for an underground drilling operation. And, and just uh, to give you some idea of how complex our regulations are in South Africa. On the left-hand side there, you can see the legal requirements. Those are all regulations from our Mine Health and Safety Act that govern this particular operation. So you've got to make sure that you comply with all of those in uh, developing your SOP. So it can become quite an arduous exercise. It can become quite a complex exercise. And then the important thing, if you look at little, at little item 10 at the bottom there, um, Something that's really important. If you've thought this SOP through properly, if you've developed it correctly, you will identify upfront any special tools or equipment that you need. Um, and it's very important um, that, that you define that upfront. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you one very silly example. Um, I did an SOP review with a company a little while ago um, where it was they needed a 19 millimeter 
um, open jaw spanner. Um, and uh, um, in the SOP, they did not mention that. And we tested the SOP with the guys going through it. They got to that particular point. It was a critical point of the procedure. And they had to then stop with the rig in a very, very hazardous position and run off and find a wrench. So it's very important we detail those things right up front. Okay, now the body um, is, is very simple. As I said earlier, a body is, is just three columns. Um, where you will you will list the steps. I've just extracted one page from one of the SOPs that I was talking about earlier. When you have a sequence of steps, you have the hazard and the safe work procedure. And it's really interesting. The, the first column is the critical one. If you don't get the steps right or the order of the steps right, or if you miss steps out, then your SOP will not be good. So let's look at a, a, a couple of examples here. This is an example of an SOP that I was working on a short while ago, and there's a number of very important points I, I, I want to mention. This was an SOP to replace a hoist rope. In the mining industry, we pull and lower drill rod. We use a hoist and a hoist rope. So the hoist rope goes over a crown sheave at the top of the derrick, top of the mast, and it comes down and engages with the drill rod. Now, this is a procedure to replace a hoist rope. It's, it's a very hazardous procedure. In, in our operations. And this is a procedure developed by a company, um, accepted by the mining company, and there, there are many, many things wrong with it. What, what is wrong with it? Well, first of all, there's no front end. What I'm showing you here was the total procedure. Um, there is no reference to the type of drill rig. And I can tell you now, you, you may or may not have any experience with any mineral exploration rigs, but this procedure is very different on different types of drill rig. Um, so there's no reference to a make or model of drill rig here. There's no reference to the length of the hoist rope, the design of the hoist rope, the safe workload of the hoist rope. Um, it has no number or date. Um, there's no reference to why it's necessary. Um, there's no explanation of terminology used. There's no explanation of abbreviations, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many things that are wrong with this SOP. You couldn't possibly use this as a, as a decent document. A couple of silly things here, but this is how pedantic and how clear we have to be in an SOP. We must remember that an SOP is essentially, it's a legal document. It is how you are telling um, people how to conduct procedures. And if something goes wrong, it will be your defense should you ever be in, involved in, in an investigation. So here the title says replacing a hoist rope, but the, the scope and the purpose says that it is for replacing and installing. Small words, but it's important. They haven't thought through this thing clearly. Um, we must get all of that, that wording right. It sounds silly, but it's, I think it's a very important point. Then they talk out here about locking out. We all know what lock out and tag out is. In this procedure, they lock out. Again, it looks pedantic. It might look like it's a bit nitpicky, but there they've made five different references to locking out, and everyone is worded differently. And that's not, um, that's not how it should be. If, we, if we've got that part of it, that is probably one of the most simple steps. We must so, be consistent in, in the way we do so. that. Then there's, there's other things here. They say here, um, we must do a, a mini risk assessment with the crew. Um, well, really the SOP, before you've done the SOP or before you even start it, you're gonna do a, a, a a risk assessment or some some kind of, of evaluation of the of the exercise. Then there's so many things in here, and I'm not going to belabor this. I'm not going to talk about this too long. But there are so many parts in here that are, if you understand how this process is done, you will understand that the processes are completely wrong. They are terribly hazardous. They place people in the wrong position in a drill rig. Some of the steps that they describe in here are not possible to do. Um, and this is where it becomes incredibly difficult because if anybody 
if you took this particular procedure and tried to apply it on a drill site, I could pretty much guarantee you're going to hurt someone because it is, it's just a complete mishmash. It's confused. Um, there's no order to it. It just is not, it's just a, a terrible SOP. So how do we develop then a good, decent, effective SOP? Three steps, very simple steps. Number one, describe the purpose and the scope. Make absolutely sure that you have defined what this SOP is for. And I promise you, uh, I've said this several times, I promise you that is the start. If you get that wrong, then your SOP will not make sense. That is the most important part. You then add the front end of, of it, the, the, the stuff that you've got to put in to keep everybody happy with the, with the corporate side of things. And then you compi com com compile the body in, in detail. What I want to do quickly, I suggest here that we're going to develop an SOP to make a cup of tea. Uh, probably there's something we all do 20 times a day. Or So let's look at how we would make a cup of tea. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define the scope um, of, of, our, of our procedure. So I would suggest that our procedure name would be, it would be a procedure to make a cup of tea. But now we drill down into it. It's not quite as simple as that. How are we going to boil the water? Are we going to use an electric kettle? or a gas stove, or we're going to put it on an open fire. Is the electric kettle, if we're going to use an electric kettle, for example, is it one that switches off automatically when it gets to, when it starts boiling, or is it one that you have to watch? Um, if it's on a gas stove, um, is it one that's got a whistle to let you know that when the water's boiling, or is it like a pot of water? It just boils and boils and boils. Are we going to make a pot of tea or we're going to make a cup of tea? And are we going to use tea bags or tea leaves? So these are some of the variables. So once you start considering those, how are we going to do this? It changes the scope of the SOP. And so for the purposes of our little example here, we're going to assume we're going to use an electric kettle. We're going to assume it's one that we have to watch. It doesn't have that little, uh, that automatic cutoff switch on it. And we're going to make a pot of tea and we're going to use tea bags. So now we can better define our scope of work. And we would now reword it and we say, this is a procedure to make a pot of tea using an electric kettle and tea bags. It's just a simple example of an everyday task we do many, many times a day. But as an example of, of what we are trying to um, demonstrate here, it's a very, very good example of the kind of detail we, we need to go into. So once we've done that, once we've given our SOP a name, we've defined the scope of it, we then do the rest of this and we give it um, an identification number and we refer to legislation, et cetera, et cetera. We put the rest of the front end detail into it. Now, this is the hard part. This is the really, the, the part where we tend to skip through it and we don't give it the detail, the necessary attention it requires. To compile the body, please remember we've got three columns. We've got the, the, the individual steps in the task or the activity. We then identify the hazards associated with each of those steps. We then decide how to carry out the steps. So let's, let's take an example. We're not going to do this, but in your mind, you already have in your mind, I'm sure, started to think about the steps that you go through to make a pot of tea. And, and I would bet you, you could probably put a blindfold on most people and point them in the right direction, and they'd be able to make a pot of tea for you uh, uh, pretty successfully. But let's let's just assume we've we've done that. Most people would come up with these seven steps. Um, bear in mind, we're using an electric kettle, so they would put the kettle on. They put two tea bags in the teapot. When the water's boiled, they'll pour some water into the teapot. Um, they'll then pour the tea into the cup put some milk in the cup, then put the sugar in the cup, stir the tea uh, to dissolve the sugar, and they will drink it. So we've got seven steps there. Some people might argue you put the sugar before the milk or you put the milk before the tea, but that's the part of this exercise. You've got to get this right. There's one best way to make a cup of tea, and you decide, and that's the standard. That is the way that the tea must be made. I would then argue if we really drill down into this and we look at this more carefully, there's a couple of steps here that we must uh, include there. 
before we switch the kettle on, we better make sure that there's water in the kettle. Um, we then plug it into the wall socket. Um, we'd, uh, while the kettle's boiling, we would put two tea bags in the pot. When it's boiled, we'll put the water in the teapot. Then we'll add another step here, because to make a proper cup of tea, we can't just put the water in the teapot and then pour it out. We must leave it to stand so the tea can diffuse and develop and develop its flavor. And then we carry on. The point I'm making here, guys, is that this in, in a complex, high, highly hazardous or high risk operation on your drill site or in your, in your refinery or in any of your other processes become critical. Because if you leave one of the steps out, you expose the person to risk and then you have a, you have a problem. The next step would be to identify the hazards. In putting the water in the kettle, what could go wrong? What could be wrong with that particular step? Well, number one, the water might be dirty. It might be unhygienic. Um, you might spill the water in doing it. Uh, you might splash water on the electric plug um, and so on. There might be others. You can, you can come up with, with any other hazards. Your local environment, the particular place you're working in, might have some particular um, uh, additional hazards that you would need to, to bring into place. Where you get the water from, for example, how's the water stored? Um, those will all introduce uh, additional hazard. Then we look at plugging the kettle in and so on. I don't think I need to go through this in, in a lot uh, more detail. I think you guys will all understand what we're trying to say here. Now, having identified the hazard, the next step then is to identify the safe work procedure. What? How are we going to tell this person to put water in a kettle in such a way that he will not be harmed. We've identified the hazards so that in the safe work procedure, a safe work procedure normally, not always, but normally would start off with the warnings. Ensure that there's sufficient water in the kettle to cover the element by at least three centimeters. If we don't put enough water in the kettle, uh, if the element is not covered, it's going to burn out. We're going to ensure that the kettle is not filled to more than its capacity. If we fill the kettle too full, when it starts boiling, the water is going to boil over. It's going to cause spillage and a, and a problem. And then we must ensure that the, that the electrical plug is kept completely dry. And again, guys, you could add others in here, uh, depending upon your local environment and the local condition that you're making your tea in, and so on. And we will then give the guy the step, fill the kettle with clean water to the correct level. So in other words, we've told him exactly what he's got to do to make sure that he's not going to get injured in that particular step. I'm not going to belabor this, but um, we would then go to the next um, step and we do exactly the same process. And so you would build up your, your SOP. And at the end of it, you'll have a perfect SOP to make a perfect cup of tea without harming anybody. The key here, please remember that this is an SOP to make a cup of tea, to make a pot of tea using an electric kettle and tea bags. If we used a gas stove, it would be a different procedure. And that is the key. We cannot have one procedure for different types of equipment. It's got to be different because of that uh, piece of equipment. So it's very clear from our little exercise there that even a very, very simple process um, can be complex. It can have steps that we haven't even thought of before. And in developing an SOP, we must always bear in mind the key thing. What are the key problems we make? We'll talk about problems a bit later. One of the key problems we have in developing SOP is we forget who we're writing it for. If I was writing this SOP um, for a very sophisticated uh, person who has got lots of experience it would be slightly different from if I was writing this SOP for a 12-year-old child, for example, who I was teaching to make, to make tea. We must always remember the audience, the people we're writing this SOP for. So having looked at that, how, how do we make sure that, that we get a really good SOP produced? Well, the first thing is to get the right team together, the people who know how to do that task, how to, how to, 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 to do what needs to be done. The other thing, guys, it's, uh, I've said this several times, please remember who the SOP is being written for. It's very, very important that, um, that you bear in mind the language, the, 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 the way you write it 
it's designed for a particular audience. And then, very importantly, test the SOP. Once you've written it, go out and observe it being used. Make sure that the steps are correct, all the hazards have been identified, and you've got the, safe, the, the, the correct safe working procedures. Once you've done that, you can say, right, this is a good SOP, and we can, we can move on. Last little bit here. I just want to talk quickly about some common errors that we see in, in developing an SOP. The first thing we spoke about this before is that the SOP is not correctly defined. We haven't really thought very clearly about exactly what we want to do here, and we haven't got the right description, the right purpose and scope for it. Very often, what I find is we have one SOP for a procedure involving a range of different drill rigs. For example, I looked at some the other day for, for one of the mining companies I work for. A contractor uses, um, I can't remember exactly, I think there were four different types of drill rig. And he had one procedure for pulling and lowering drill rods. They were different on all four of them. They pulled rods in different ways. They had different equipment, different ways of holding drill pipe, different ways of backing it off. You can't do that. If you've got a unique piece of equipment, there's a unique SOP. The most common is that the steps are not all identified. If the steps aren't identified in the correct order, we, we could have a problem. Probably the most important part is that not all the hazards are identified. If the hazards aren't identified, obviously we're working with unexposed, with, with, with exposed risk. And then the wording, we mentioned this before, please remember who it's written for. Don't make the wording complex. If you need four steps to explain something, put four steps in. Don't assume people know how to do things. And one of the key things, never use the word if in an SOP. You can't, uh, an SOP is an SOP, it's a standard operating procedure. If you, if you need to put the word if in, you must question whether you need another SOP. We, we can't allow or we mustn't ask the person doing the procedure to make subjective decisions. Um, it defeats the object of the, of the exercise. We must remember as well that the, the, the SOP is an administrative tool that comes out of the risk assessment. And if the risk assessment is poor, we won't, we, we'll, we'll miss some SOPs. And what I see, because many mining companies um, that, that I work with, many contractors, look upon SOPs as being paper in files. It is there to satisfy a compliance requirement. And, and, and then we've all lost our way. I believe that if, if the quality of the SOPs are poor, it tells me straight away, that there's unidentified risk, the safety management system is poor, it's incomplete, and you will have an accident. And if there are missing SOPs, um, it just indicates a poor safety management system, one that is, is not, uh, it's not rigorous, it just doesn't address all, all hazard. Um, okay, a, a well-developed SOP in, in the context of what we do in South Africa, and I'm sure in the event of an accident or incident, you will have an investigation, and that investigation may involve some very difficult questions having to be answered. So a good SOP is your defense mechanism, if I can put it that way. It reduces your liability in the event of an accident or incident. It is perfect teaching material. In order to teach people, we use the word training so much in our industries, but we never use the word assess. And if you have a well-developed SOP, you use it to train a person and you use it to assess the person. We call them PTOs, plan task observations. And it also gives the contractor and yourselves, if, if it's the right type of SOP, a tool to incrementally develop staff. That as they progress through less complicated to more complicated SOPs, you can recognize them for their development uh, in, that, in that process. And this is the most important point. This, I go and do audits on drill sites. I look at SOPs and you see that there are SOPs poorly written, poorly developed, and there's SOPs missing. It indicates to me straight away that the safety management system is wrong. It's not properly developed. They haven't got the right focus on safety. And that to me sets off lots and lots and lots of, of alarm bells. So it's very important we look at this whole process, make sure it's complete, make sure the SOPs are 
properly developed and they're complete. The bottom line, SOPs are an essential part of our industry, whether it's oil and gas or mineral exploration, doesn't matter. And we must do them properly because there's no question it could easily save a life. That is a very, very good question. Um, you know, I think, first of all, let me just, just say this. I, I think many mining companies, and my experience with mining companies, not oil and gas companies, and, and, and maybe you guys would, would, would identify with what I'm saying. What I find is very often we try to, not that we try to, but we complicate things. We, we make things too difficult. Um, a checklist is a is a critical part of any safety management process. There's no question, but a checklist cannot replace an SOP. An SOP tells you how to do something. A checklist will a, a checklist applies to a piece of equipment um, or a, or a combination of pieces of equipment. It tells you to check a pressure relief valve, to check a guard, uh, to check a fluid level, to check a temperature or an operating pressure or something of that nature. It doesn't, it's not a replacement for a procedure. So I think one of the key things is we must define very clearly what that tool is doing for us. And a checklist is not an SOP. So if, if that answers your question, I don't believe you can replace, a, a, a checklist will be part of an SOP, but it is not an SOP. It's not a procedure in itself. Again, that's a really, really good point. Um, I, I think the trick really is is to make is to make the SOP as short as possible. Um, and and having said that, I'm I'm kind of almost contradicting myself because if you look at that little one we did there in in making tea, um, as I said, you guys could probably put a blindfold on and and make a cup of tea without hurting yourself. Um, but it, it's it's it. Uh, we added we got up to seven steps just in making a cup of tea. I think the key is that if the procedure requires 15 steps, then it must require 15 steps. It cannot be. You can't just make it shorter to try and make it simpler. You try and make the steps as simple as possible. Um, and I'm not sure I've I'm not sure of any way of of making that any easier for you. I I don't see a problem in in saying that this is written for this level of employee, whatever whatever levels you use in your in your structure. Effectively, you want somebody who knows how to write an SOP, and then you need what we call subject matter experts, somebody who does the procedure and who can identify the steps, and therefore you can then jointly identify the hazards associated with you. It doesn't have to be 13 people. It can be two people. Um, it can't just be one person, I don't believe. You need more than one person to, to develop an SOP properly. Um, it is it is it is unrealistic to expect someone to walk around with a file of SOPs and every time he's got to do something he pages through the the SOP to find the, the, the correct point. But the SOPs must be available should he need reminding. And this is all part of your 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 skills development process with your with your your guys. Um, uh, let's take a, a simple example. You employ a new person and he starts with you on the 1st of May. Um, when he starts with you, he's got to have some training and development process. He's, he's been employed to do certain jobs on, on, a, on a drill site or in a production facility, whatever the case happens to be. 
And these are the typical things he's going to do. And your job is to train him on those particular uh, 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 procedures, those particular tasks he's got to conduct, and you train him based on the SOP. So for the first two or three or four times, he might need to have the SOP handy. The supervisor, the person that's training him, will have it handy to make sure he follows that procedure as it's described. Once he's ready to be assessed, you think he's now competent to carry out that procedure, you would then do a, a PTO or, uh, to make sure he's competent. It will not then be necessary for him to walk around with an SOP. Uh, it becomes second nature. But what's critically important is that periodically you check him, see on him to make sure that he is indeed following that procedure and not taking uh, any shortcuts. You, you would not, as a, as a principle of your business, you do not want to tell him how to do his job. So you would not want to go along and tell a building constructing a, a building a, a building a, um, a construction guy how to build. That's his job. That's why you've employed him because he's the expert. However, what you have got to do as part of your onboarding program, part of your um, your program to make sure that he is not gave, have an accident on your side is to ensure that he has the correct SOPs, he's done the correct risk assessment for the work he's going to do, and he's got the correct SOPs for his for his work that he's going to do. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but, but you're not going to tell him what to do, um, but you will make sure that his SOPs are to the standard that you would require. Um, and again, you might not have full knowledge of all of the procedures he's going to go through in, in building whatever he's going to build for you. But at least you've got to make some primary effort to ensure that his safety management system's in place and the SOPs are a critical part of that. It's only where there is a, an SOP that's identified it then is part of his job description. It's part of his evaluation, part of his training, part of his assessment process. And that answers the question. That then makes sure that the right people get the right procedure. Uh, it's got to be part of their training. It's got to be signed off that they've been trained in this, in this procedure. They're aware of it. Um, they've been assessed that they, they know how to take care of themselves and then you can rest. Then you can say we've, we've, we've done our job correctly.